Good morning. How did you all sleep? Buenos dias. Good morning. Last night we were talking about a crisis of identity. Our culture, our young people in this country of ours and in all the world is going through this crisis. You see it. People try to identify as this, as that, with this label, with that label, with this group, with that group, all trying to find their place in this big, scary world. We saw the story of these four young men about your age and how their identity was tried to be taken away from them. When they identify with the true and one living God, their names were changed after the gods of this nation, this culture, this philosophy, this worldview that tried to press on them a false ideology that's against everything that God stands for and who God is. Guess what? You're in that same environment. Try to mention the name of Jesus in your schools. Try to hold a prayer meeting, and you're going to see the resistance. You're going to see the ridicule, the mock, the mocking that you will get. Today, we're going to talk about our identity. If you have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, if you have received them, received his words as being true, and what he says about you and I as individuals, that we are bad, deserving of death. If you receive that message, and you receive the message about Jesus Christ, that he is God and the son of God. And he came, became a human. And he lived a perfect life for 33 years. And when the time was right, he died on a cross in your place, and in my place. If you have accepted that, This next message is very important to you because it's about finding your identity in him. No one else. Hello? Okay. Back up. So in him, we have our value, our worth, and our identity. And no one else. Today, we're going to talk about growing, right? Because salvation is not the end goal. Salvation is the beginning of a new life. You heard that? Salvation is the beginning of a new life. Having your sins forgiven is just the beginning. God does not want to stop there. He's building a new creation in you, in me. Just like he had the power to just speak and the heavens were made, the stars, the galaxies, even the microscopic living organisms in our world by the power of his voice, of his word. But you know what? For the new creation in you, he had to send his son to die on the cross. And that is special. That means something. And so, paying attention to what he wants for us is critical. He wants you to be like his son. When Jesus got baptized and he came out of the waters, the heavens opened up. The Holy Spirit came down on him as an affirmation that he was representing humanity. And then a voice was heard. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he wants you to become a daughter just like his beloved son. He wants you to become a son, just like his beloved son, because he is our big brother. Jesus is our brother. That's amazing that God would come down and become human. But anyway, let's get into this. Today, we're going to be looking in Colossians. Here we 
Here we go. Is it on? Oh. Okay. Now we're going to be looking at this. Putting to death the deeds of the flesh. What in the world does that mean? Anybody have any idea? Raise your hand. Call it out. Shout it out. What is the flesh? If you have been born again, what is the flesh? Emily. Your sinful nature. The old you. The old Rigo. The one that wanted to cuss up a storm. The one that always picked a fight because he was the shortest in the crowd and he had something to prove. Put that to death. The one that wants to please those inward desires that you try to put, keep hidden. That's the old you. And we're going to see how we need to put that and nail it because he nailed it to the cross. And daily, we need to put that old self. Next slide. Okay, I was going the wrong way. So the first thing we're going to see is an exhortation. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, if you have received Christ, and in the same manner that you have received Christ, Jesus, the Lord. Notice that. You're not just receiving a man. You're receiving a man with a title. He is king of kings. He's the king of the new Jerusalem. Amen. Therefore, as you have received Christ, Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. And how are we supposed to receive Christ? Is it by our deeds, by our actions? Is there anything that we could do to receive Christ? What's the answer? It's one thing. Believe him. By faith, you have been saved. By faith, you have been saved. And it's grace. Unmerited favor. And so, Paul is telling us here that in the same manner that we receive Christ, we need to continue to walk. And what does walk insinuate? Constant movement. Constant movement. Our life should be dynamic. If you are the same person, if you are the same Christian that you were a month ago, six months ago, a year ago, you are not walking the way you should be walking. Walk in him. Be involved in him. Talk about him. Read about him. Learn about him. And it says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Now you're going to see the words in yellow up there. What are they? Verbs. <laughs> Very good. We got an English major. I don't know about that. But verbs, receive, walk, rooted, built up, established, instructed, and then from the heart overflowing with gratitude. These are the verbs that you need to be displaying in your young Christian life. Because if you don't, there's a warning. If you're not, if you haven't first received Christ, that's the first step we got to take. Right? Receive him as your Lord, as your Savior. Then you have to walk in him. Live that life. Then you have to start building a foundation. You know, Psalms 1 is a beautiful psalm. I'll read it to you. Just pay attention. And think about this, about being, about growing and about roots. Right? Think about this, right? How blessed is the man, the young man, the young lady. How blessed are you if you do not walk in the counsel of the wicked? And so you see here, right? If you're not walking with the evil ones, with the wicked ones, with the ones that don't have Christ in their heart, calls you blessed. Nor stand in the path of sinners. Now look at the posture, right? 
We're supposed to be actively growing towards the image of Christ. But what happens most times? We start working with other people and we're not walking in him. And we start walking with our friends, the ones that are probably smoking weed, probably drinking, probably uh, talking about young ladies the way they shouldn't be, and doing their own thing, right? We start walking with these people and they start corrupting our good habits. And they start changing or challenging our worldview and what we believe. Then what happens? It says that we stand in the path of sinners. The next verse says, but his del- nor does he sit in the seat of scoffers. And so now you're just not even growing. You're not doing anything. And that's not what Christ wants. And you become static, stagnant in your Christian life. That's the pattern that happens in all of us. It happened in me. But it says, but his delight is in the law. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Right here. I know this is old school, right? You probably have it in your tablets, your phones, your iPads. Notice I'm an Apple guy, right? (laughs) You have it on your Android, your Samsung. But it's the word in you. It's the word in you. It says, is that delight? Is that my delight? Or do I just read it because I want to please and, and just check something off? No, I delight in it. And it says, in his law, he meditates day and night. And this is a constant soaking in the word. Because if you're not soaking in the word, guess what's going to start creeping in? The philosophies of Babylon. The culture is going to start creeping in. And it's going to corrupt your ways. So what's the warning? See to it. See to it. See to it that no one takes you captive. Not that professor from college. Not that science teacher. Not that teacher who claims to be an atheist. See to it that no one takes you captive. Against your will. Through how? Through the philosophies and empty deception. Philosophies and empty deception. Now, philosophy is not a bad thing. But when it goes against God and what God stands for, who God is, it ruins the life of a believer. These philosophies, these perspectives, are according to the tradition of men. How much time do I have? No. I, so what time? Okay. It's a 11.30? Thank you. So the, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world. And so you see here that you're going to have people in a world current, a flow, working against your Christian values. And it's against Christ. Now, there's many isms, right? We're going to talk about a couple of them, seven to be exact. Now, the word uh, naturalism, who knows what naturalism is? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Earth. Yeah, so planetary care, tree huggers. Not that that's bad, right? Because that's God's creation. But naturalism says it's a philosophical belief that everything arises from natural properties and causes. So there's no supernatural thing. There is no God who created the heavens and the earth. It was a big bang. There is... No God designing our universe with such perfection. It was a random act, a 
of chance. That's what naturalism teaches. And you're going to see that from the very beginning, Genesis is challenged because of this worldview. Right? They don't exist in God. Angels don't exist. Demons don't exist. God does not exist. And it starts going. The second thing that we see is relativism. And we saw that yesterday. Relativism. What does relativism basically promote? Is there one God or many gods? It's all relative. You know, you could worship Allah. You could worship Buddha. It doesn't matter. It's all relative. As long as it's true to you, so be it. It's false. Jesus says, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, the life. Knowledge does not depend and is not limited to the individual. Like one plus one is always going to be two. But relativism says, maybe. It could be three, it could be four. It all depends to your version of the truth. But God is not interested in your version of the truth. He tells you what the truth is. He is the truth. Humanism. Humanism is a philosophy that usually rejects the supernatural. And it stresses the individual dignity. Your rights. Really? You have a right to do this, to do that. Nobody has a right to tell you how to behave. God does. He made you. And he redeemed you with the price, the blood of Christ. And if you haven't been redeemed by the, by the blood of Christ, well, guess who owns you? <laughs> that falling angel, that covering cherub named Satan. He's your master. As much as you don't want to admit it, he is controlling your life. Then there's hedonism. Hedonism just teaches that, you know what? Do whatever makes you feel good. Pleasure is his God. That's the world philosophy for hedonism. If it feels good to you, do it. If, it doesn't, if you're not feeling it, don't do it. If you don't feel like going to church, eh, stay home. And it's based on feelings. And pleasure is the ultimate good. So many people get dragged away by their feelings. But scripture says that there's nothing more deceitful than the, man, than the heart of man and of women. We can even deceive ourselves. That's how good at lying we are, right? For many years, I thought that I was a Christian. Just because I was born and raised into a Christian home, and I went and I learned all the verses, and I knew all the songs, I deceived myself. Because I wasn't really in his presence. I wasn't really walking in him. Then there's materialism. Oh, boy. Especially in our country. What is materialism? This one's easy. What is it? Oh, I see you want to say something. Don't be shy. Whisper it to the person next to you. She'll tell me. What's materialism? Materialism is a theory or philosophy. Yes. Yes. Possessions. Man. What's the American dream? Money, 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 money. Right? Get that big car, that Mercedes Benz, that AMG. That Bentley, get that nice house, build up your retirement plan, have a fat bank account. And we all are guilty of this, right? You want to have the, what's the latest iPhone? 13? Man, oof, $1,000 plus for an iPhone. Materialism, we're guilty of it. We put more emphasis on the possessions, and that's what really matters to a lot of people. And the last one, but not least, is the one 
where it attacks God and his existence directly. It's atheism. A philosophical or religious position in the disbelief in the existence of God, the true God, or any gods. The new atheists say there is no God. No. None. And they're not just conformed with themselves believing in it. They want to push that agenda on you. And they're going to put doubts in your mind. And they're going to try to create inconsistencies in what the Bible says. But if you're not grounded in studying your Bible, because your Bible reveals a lot about who God is, you're going to be taken captive to that city, Babylon. And you're going to be educated in their worldviews and in their philosophies. So what is... The expectation for a young believer like yourself. What is it? Well, Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 tell us this. Therefore, if you have been raised up, okay, with Christ. And what does raised up with Christ imply or is alluding to? What happened to Jesus Christ on the third day? He resurrected. He came back to life. Amen. He didn't stay in the grave. He is alive. He is alive. And he wants to live in you. He was raised up. And it says we have been raised up together with the same power that it took to raise Jesus Christ from the grave. Your new life. In your new life, you have been raised with him and in him and that is the key to your identity you have this new life the words in green what does it say there's nothing else for you to do in the greek the word is continue to seek keep seeking keep seeking what that new iphone that car that boyfriend or that girlfriend keep seeking the things above and you're going to start to see this counterposition, right? Babylon, Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar, Jesus Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is. And notice he has been seated. What he did was finished. I have a little bracelet here to remind myself. It's in Greek. It says, tetelestai. Tetelestai means... It is finished. And when Christ finished his work, he sat down because there was no more sacrifice to make. He paid the price. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Jesus paid the price. He did it all. He's, he has been seated at the right hand of God. And it says, set your mind on the things above. Not on the things that are on earth. Do you know that scripture says that this earth, this beautiful place, with all its nice colors, its beautiful sunsets, its magnificent sunrises, its abundant source of oxygen. Like, do you get up and worry that oxygen is going to run out today? Perfect design. The thing that we breathe out is food for the, the things that make oxygen that give to us. And there is this codependency between us and the world that got created. And science is going to tell you that this was chance. It takes more faith to believe in evolution, in atheism, than it does in Jesus Christ. Because it makes sense. It gives us a coherent, a complete worldview of our universe and the things that are not material. There's things that are not material that are real, right? When you have fears, is that fear real? Yes. But could you taste, touch, weigh, fear? How about love? Is love real? Yeah. What color is love? <laughs> right? It's not material, but it's so real. Hope. 
can't taste hope. You can't smell it. But it's real. Now, when all those things start to come and meet in the person of Christ, that's when you start enjoying life. And you start living eternal life, abundant life. Eternal life is not until, until we get to heaven. Eternal life, you start experiencing the moment you have been forgiven. Yeah. Yeah. The moment you, you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. You paid it all. No one can snatch that eternal life from you. Now, what they can snatch away is the joy of enjoying that life. Don't let the world do that. Don't let yourself be taken captive. Set your mind on the things above. What you fill your mind with is so crucial, young people. I know. I know we have these devices that you can get information instantly. And you know what so-and-so is doing or what's, when's the next party or when something is popping off. You know exactly when that's happening. I mean, at our fingertips, you have access to things that your eyes should not be seeing. At, a, at an instant, we have access to music that is, in, that in, is enveloping a message that is against God. And that hook of that beat gets you going and it puts your senses down. And then that's when Satan starts saying, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to think. This is what I want you to feel. And you start moving away from your maker, from your creator, from your savior. The king of Babylon did that. If you read Daniel, at one point, he's like, look at my kingdom. And he erects a statue. And he says, you know what? At this point, at this set time in the day, everyone in my kingdom is going to bow down to my statue. And guess what he enveloped that message with? Music. There was music being played as the people bowed down to the statue of the king of Babylon. And when you start listening to music that you shouldn't be listening to, <laughs> you start bowing down to the ruler of this world without you even knowing it. Be careful. I enjoy, you know, I enjoyed hip hop when I was growing up. But there's, if you like that genre of music, there's Christian artists that are singing and praising God with that type of beat. Be careful what you listen to. If you like country, I'm starting to get an appreciation for country, being down in the South. I thought that I would never love country, but I, I'm, my people down South are listening, so I got to give a shout out to country music. Hey, but there's Christian artists that sing that genre. And if there isn't one genre, pick up an, a guitar, pick up an instrument, and you start praising God to the genre of music that you like. Why not? That is the freedom that we have. But don't be taken by the message, the subtle message that will make you fall away. And the battle is being fought in your mind, but also in your heart. Now, we have this philosophy. You're going to see three green phrases up there, right? For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And so you see here three tenses of time, past, present, and future. In the past, if you are a believer, Christ paid your sins. And it says that you have died with him. The verses before says we were raised with him, but it's reminding us that we have also died with him. You have died. And in the present, our life is hidden, is kept safe. What do you do with your identity? You know that identity theft, how much billions of dollars has cost us in this country? Anybody take a guess? 
26.5 billion have been lost because of identity theft. And so what do we try to do with our identity? Hide it. And that's why we got passwords. That's why we have, uh, when, you know, when some other device logs on, it asks me for it to confirm. And so we try to safe keep our identity. And it says that our identity is kept safe in Christ. And in the future, what you do from the moment that you are born again till you die or till Christ comes back, when he is revealed, then our life will be revealed. What we have done for Christ, who we have been for Christ, will be revealed. Past, present, and future. And what Paul is leading us to understand is that we have died to our old self along with its desires. And you can see that there's desires that are sinful. You know what sin does to us? What does sin do, really? What is the purpose of sin, of going against God's nature? Well, Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7, tell us about what, a conversation that God had with Cain. Who remembers who Cain was? Go back to your Sunday school classes. Adam and Eve had their first two children, Abel and Cain. And God asked them to bring an offering, right, to worship him. Now, Cain and Abel had been raised by Adam and by Eve, and they, they were instructed that in order to approach God, you needed blood. Why do I say that? When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they put on themselves when they saw that they were naked? Leaves, right, from nature. They didn't know any better. Eve just wanted to be like God. That was her real temptation. It wasn't the fruit. <laughs> Satan said to Eve, nah, you're not going to die. God knows that the day that you eat of this tree that he forbade, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. And she walked away. Man, I touched that fruit and nothing happened because she had given the wrong message, right? God said, do not eat. But she added, do not touch or eat. And so she walked away. She was like, touched, but I haven't died. Hmm. I could be like God. No one can tell me what to do. And you're going to see here that submission, submitting to authority, is a major problem from each and every one of us. That's how we get timeout. That's how we got spankings. That was, that's why we have suspensions. I got expelled. Yeah. But we have punishment because we have a problem with authority. And she's like, man, who's got to tell me what to eat? And she took it. She saw that it was good to eat. And she ate it. She was like, who's this guy to tell me what to do? Looking at Adam. Here, you eat. And guess what? They both said. And they sold fig leaves. God said, uh-uh. And he clothed them with what? Animal skin. What happened to that animal? What happened to that animal? God had to sacrifice that animal. And so they were taught from very, from very young that to approach and worship God, a life for a life was required. Abel shows up with his from the, from the best of his herd, he shows up with an animal sacrifice. Cain shows up with fruit. You know, it was, yeah, he labored, but there was a mist that used to come up from the ground. He, he didn't even have to fertilize it or water it because it did it itself. He just had to pick it up. It wasn't a price to him. It wasn't a sacrifice to him. He just brought it to the Lord. And then the Lord looked with favor on Abel and not Cain. And Cain gets... He gets so upset. Listen what God tells him. Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen or your countenance fallen? Why are you sad? Why are you depressed? Why are you down? If you do well, will not your countenance or your spirits be lifted up? If you do not do well, sin is crouching 
at the door. And its desire is for you. But you must master it. And so what sin tries to do is take you captive. Make you its slave. So many lives destroyed by pornography. And this is especially um, rampant among young men, even in the Christian environment. Becomes a vice. And you try to erase those images that are in your mind, in your memory. And Satan just turns it on. You might be sitting in the middle of a worship service, the Lord's Supper. And he turns it on and tries to take you captive. Set your mind on the things above. Colossians 3.5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now, these are desires, right? The word for immorality is the same word in the Greek from which we get pornography, porneia, immorality. And this is, involves an illicit, forbidden physical sexual activity that is not in the boundaries that God designed of that covenant relationship called marriage. And it could be anything, right? It says, consider your body dead to those passions, to that immorality, to that desire, impurity. The Greek word is, means moral filth. Just no sort of values. Passion. The word for passion is this, this enslaving desire that springs from lust. I just want that. I need to have this. And I'll do anything to get it. Evil desire is anything that is against, against God's will. Greed. Why is greed in there? What is greed? Anyone? What's greed? When you don't, you'll do anything to please your own desire, right? This is an obsessive, intense desire to fulfill your wants. Greed. And it says that all these things amount to idolatry. What is idolatry? Worshiping a false god, right? An idol. And guess who that false god is? It's not the king of Babylon. When you have these things in your life, you're worshiping yourself. And just like Eve, who wanted to displace God, you want to take the place of God and fulfill your own wants and desires. That's what happened to Lucifer. The covering cherub, this, this creature, he was so beautiful. He was covered in precious stones. There was no one like him. He was second to God. But he took his eyes off God. He started looking at himself. I'm not bad. I'm going to go up to the mountain of God and be like God. It's the same thing that he enticed Eve with. You could be like God. You could be your own God. Did he have a problem with authority? Yes. And Satan, from that moment on, that there was pride in his heart, his whole life has been spent to throw God's authority to the side. We're going to see that God has a design for authority in this new creation, this new body that he's building, where each and every one of you becomes a member of this supernatural body. It's not an organization. It's not just a church name. You, when you become a believer, you become a vital member of the body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the head. He is the head honcho. 
the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. But Satan is not going to give up. He's going to try to destroy this body, destroy his image. Don't be a worshiper of yourself. Next slide. Oh, there we go. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. There's a putting to death that we need to go through every day. Because this old self doesn't just go away when you become a Christian. It's dormant. It's with you. And we will not be freed from this body of sin until our salvation has been fully completed. When we are freed from the presence of sin. We have already been freed from the penalty of sin. Christ did that in the past, 2,000 years ago. He paid the price. In our daily lives, he is freeing us from the power of sin. One day, young brother, young sister, we will be free from the presence of sin. What a glorious day that would be. Now, so we saw this tension, right, between life and death. Between living and walking and between putting to death. Now we're going to see something that you, we do all the time. Every day. I don't know about teenagers so much if they do it every day. But it's putting on and putting off. You put on. You put off new, your dirty clothes and you put on your new, right? Mostly every day. Yes, we try to do that, right? Our parents teach us. So, we're going to see this model here. And this is critical to personal growth. Colossians 3, 8 and 9 talk about this putting aside or putting off. But now you also put them all aside. All those desires, put them to the side. He talks about these things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have laid aside the old self with evil practices. And what do these things do? Do they build unity? When you talk in anger to your brother or sister, when you just talk with out of wrath, when you put on social media something false about so, so and so, you think you're going to be united? No. It just creates division. So the, the, the first things that we saw are just focused on you. These are dividing you from other people. And you're trying to harm other people. It says these are evil practices. Now, what are we supposed to put on? What are we putting on? It says, put on the new self who is being renewed. Notice that constant action, being renewed every day. Every day you have to renew yourselves. How do we renew ourselves? Reading scripture. Not only hearing it, but doing it. We spend time in prayer asking for the things that we're anxious for, the things that are lacking in our lives. That's how we get renewed. It says, we, and we are being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created you. So that image of Christ is the goal. Salvation is not the goal. Being Christ-like is your goal. It is my goal. There's nothing better. You, you want to be a doctor? Great. If you're a Christian doctor, it's even better because you are displaying Christ in your profession. You want to be a singer, an artist, an engineer? 
You want to be a plumber, a garbage man? Be a Christian garbage man. And everything that you do, do it for his glory. Amen? There's nothing better than being like Christ. Colossians 3.11. This renewal says that we're being renewed, but it's a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all and in all. Now this portion, and there's another one in Galatians 3.28, has been taken out of context to say that, you know, there is no distinction, and we can blur the lines. And this is where the world trips over their feet. Because male and female are different. God made us that way. We are complementary. We fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. But what did the world try to do? Blur the lines. You know, I saw a story about a transgender UFC fighter, right? What was born a man, a male, transitioned over to female and started competing in UFC. Now, you know UFC is a violent sport. What was the outcome? This transgender woman, or I'm going to call him man that pretends to be a woman, crushed the, scr- the skull of a female competitor. Tragic story. But this is the world that we're living in, confused and chaos. Men are stronger naturally than women. We're bigger. Our bones are denser. Our voices are different. Our reproductive systems are different. Our way of processing data, of displaying emotion, of communicating, different. Because God made us that way. And they try to blur the lines and say, you could be whoever you want to be. And this is where identity starts to get confused. Who am I? You see it in, in, in when people start identifying with things that don't make sense. Right? God created them male and female and nothing in between. But Satan is trying to cause chaos and go against God's authority. Christ is our perfect image of God to emulate. Christ is the perfect standard of expression and fellowship within the body of Christ and to those who are perishing. And there's things that are similar about us, but there's things that are distinct. And we're going to see later on how we're supposed to display that in the body of Christ, which is the church. Your local body, where you gather together, one purpose, that is to seek God through Christ. Colossians 3, 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart. Remember before, what what was the instruction? Set your mind. Now, it's telling us to put something else on. Put on a heart. Just any heart? Just your natural heart? We already saw that our heart can deceive us, right? But he's saying, put on this new heart, one that feels the way God feels, a heart of compassion. And think about all the friends that you have that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They're on their way to an eternity that is described in Scripture as a lake of fire. You know what causes, what's, what's the real thing that makes he- hell such a terrible place. It's not the heat. It's not the lake of fire. It's not that you're not going to see some of your relatives, your mom or your dad. You know what makes hell? Hell is that you will be separated from your life source, from God. He's the source of all life. Eternally, there will be no opportunity to be reconciled to him. And that's what makes hell, hell. 
compassion. Have compassion for each other, especially for those that need that healing that you have experienced. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. All right, Galatians 5, fruit of the Spirit. Sounds so similar, doesn't it? Where are these things coming from? From what the Holy Spirit is doing in you, inwardly, if you allow him to. Notice it's not it, it's him. The Holy Spirit is a person. He wants to have a relationship with you. It says that we're supposed to do two things, bearing and forgiving. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And I'm not saying that you're not going to have beef, problems, commotion, scandal with people at your church. Because ultimately, we're a place full of redeemed sinners. And that old nature is still in us, right? Oh, you ask my wife. She'll tell you right away that I'm not perfect. She'll be the first one to check me. When I say something wrong, she'll check me. And I'm grateful for that. When I'm driving and somebody cuts me off, that's when the old ego comes out. She's like, remember you're a Christian. And brings me back down to earth. Those are the type of people you need to surround yourself with. The people that tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And there's going to be churches out there that tell you, oh, this old gooey feeling and this emotion. And there's going to be churches that make you feel uncomfortable. Oh, I don't like going there because I feel like somebody's talking behind my back. Like when the preacher preaches, he's always like talking to me and pointing at me and looking at me funny. Those are the type of churches you need to go to because they will tell you, the speaker will tell you if he's preaching from the Bible the way he should, he will challenge you. He will make you feel uncomfortable. And when you come out of that comfort zone, that's when you start growing. You know how a pearl is made? Right? Precious, precious pearls? Well, precious pearls are irritations caused in oysters. Sand gets in there and gets, gets underneath their skin, and they start forming this protective shell around the sand until it becomes a pearl. That's the Christian life right there. When the word challenges you to change who you are into the identity of the one image who you should be seeking, that's when you start seeing pearls of the Holy Spirit. At first, ooh, they hurt. Ooh, when they tell me the truth, mm, you shouldn't be doing that. It hurts. Because I don't want to submit to that authority. And when I do, the end product is something precious for God. Bearing and forgiving one another. It's not easy. And loving people that are nice to you is, is a piece of cake. It's that difficult brother or that difficult sister. It's that elder who's always criticizing the way you dress or telling you you shouldn't be listening to this type of music or hanging with that person or that your relationship with that unbeliever is going to just cause trouble down the, down the line. When you start embracing that and start seeing that God is working through that brother or that sister, or that he's speaking to you directly. You're going to see that your life is going to start to fall in place. And we're going to end with this. Let's end with that. Beyond all these things. If there's anything that you take away from this session. Put on love. Love is not an adjective. 
Love is an action word. Love does not seek to receive. Love seeks to give. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave his most precious relationship, his son. I have three children. If I were told to give one of them up for a hardened criminal that's on death row and to exchange their places, I don't, I don't think I would do it. But God only had one beloved son. And he exchanged him for you. Think about that. Does he love you? I think by, by the standards of anybody, I think he does. How many times have you rejected that message? How many times have you heard this gospel? And it's just gone one ear, the other. Don't walk out of those doors today. If you have not received that offer, it remains an offer, like I said last night. Let it become a gift. The gift of life. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin, what we earn and deserve, is death. Period. But the gift of God is eternal life in Him. Put it on in love. If there's one piece of clothing, spiritual clothing, that you're going to put on, put on love. Christ said to His disciples, right? We're about what? How many young people here? Like about 30? 40? You could do so much. You can transform this world. God used 12 men, a couple of fishermen, roughnecks. He used the tax collector. He even chose one that would betray him. These 12. Oh, he chose another one that used to persecute his saints. Right? And he thought he was doing it as a favor to God. And he chose these 12 men. He has transformed humanity. We are still being impacted by that name of Jesus because he lives. And he told his 12 disciples, this is the distinctive mark, right? This is how you're going to stand out in this world that offers so many things. This is how you're going to stand out. If you have love, for one another, just as I loved you. When we start putting that into practice, people are going to see a different gospel. The gospel according to Daniel. The gospel according to Jeff. The gospel according to James. The gospel according to Ezekiel. The gospel according to you. And you're going to become a living letter of love to this world that needs healing. They first need to be broken, then they need to be built up in him. How do you identify yourself? Are you identifying with the group of the world or with the one person that loved you so much that gave it all? Not only gave it all, continues and keeps on giving. Amen? Please, put on love. If you need to talk about how to become a son, a daughter of the Almighty God, talk to one of us. Talk to Ezekiel, to Jeff, to myself, to a counselor. When you go back home after this weekend, get plugged in into a Bible-believing church. Not because church is going to save you, because there, but because there, 
That's where the body of Christ is meeting every week. Encouraging, reinforcing the things that he teaches in his word. And we are held accountable to each other to continue stirring each other to love and grow. Let's bow our heads, please. Close your eyes. Think about what God has said to you. Not what I have said. This isn't my message. I'm just an instrument. Think about what he wants in your life. Think about probably some of the disappointments in your life. Some of the hurt, some of the pain, some of the shame. Bring it all to Christ. He has done it all. He has paid the price. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father. You have expressed yourself in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. And everything that we need to know about you, Heavenly Father, we see in your beloved son. But you didn't stop there. Even after your son has left this earthly realm in which we walk back and forth, he, your son, sent the Holy Spirit to live and dwell in us, to seal those of us that have been washed by the blood of Christ, have been redeemed and forgiven, sealed us as a possession precious to you. And just like the vessels of the temple, help us to be used in the worship and service of you, Father. Help us to guard from being taken away and being made irrelevant. Help us to be salt, to produce in others a thirst, to preserve the decay of this world. Help us to be light, pure, a reflection of who Christ is, to guide those that are in darkness in confusion, in chaos. To be a light that cuts away those things that do not please you. Just like a laser. A light that can be reflected. It can show others and point others to the way to Jesus. Because that's the only thing that we can do as believers. Pray for every young lady, every young man, that they may find a, their full fulfillment in design and purpose in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray and give you thanks for the name of Jesus that is precious and above all name. Thank you.